Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Jason Cohen with us. Jason, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're a guest we've been wanting to have on for a long time. It seems like anytime you write or speak online, uh, it, it makes light bulbs go off. <laughs> so right. you're one of those kind of guys. <laughs> Well, uh, Jason, you are the, a serial entrepreneur uh, building and selling Smart Bear, and now you're working on WP Engine. So let's kind of talk about WP Engine a little bit. Um, tell us, what is WP Engine? It's a managed WordPress hosting platform. So if you, if you know what Heroku is, it's like Heroku for WordPress, meaning we handle the deployment side of WordPress hosting, like making sure your site is fast and scalable and secure, all our tech support people know WordPress. Um, but on the other hand, there's also dev tools. So you can use Git to push to WordPress. You can um, you have staging areas you can use. Um, there's an advanced backup system. So things for developers of WordPress sites as well as actually deploying the WordPress sites. Gotcha. Um, now, early on, when you first kind of had the idea and you're trying to figure out if there was a market for this, um, how important was traction for the validation of WP Engine, and how did you kind of find that traction? Well, I define traction as people who pay you money, okay. which is different than how uh, some people define traction. And so to me, it's all important. It's what a business is, is people giving you money. Otherwise, it's a project or a hobby um, that you hope maybe can become a business. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want to quit your day job and you want to actually have a business that sustains you, then the only kind of traction is that people want to give you money. Yeah. So it was, it was vital. And so um, at the beginning... Uh, I, it started because my blog gets on Hacker News all the time and then it would f go down because WordPress doesn't scale that well under traffic. And so I would ask other bloggers, you know, is, is there some place I could go to get WordPress hosting where they handle that kind of thing? And I don't care if it's 50 bucks a month or something. Like, I don't need it to be your hosting prices. I just need it to work. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they kept saying, I, I don't know, but if you find it, tell me because <laughs> I need that too. <laughs> so then it turned into customer development. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I made this fast and scale and had a staging area, would you give me 50 bucks a month? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think uh, the traction is customer validation. I think, um, you know, along those same lines, some people say in the customer validation phase, you shouldn't talk about price because you're just trying to understand their pain, their life, validate your theories about what is true, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to figure out pricing or branding or positioning or something like that. And I disagree. I, I appreciate that perspective. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But I disagree because I feel like pricing um, is a critical part of what you're trying to figure out in customer development. Will they actually pay? Mm -hmm. And the way to, think, to, to imagine this is you think about your normal customer development call, and at the end you say, and by the way, it's $1,000 a month. And how will that change their attitude toward, in fact, are they willing to become a customer and so on. Mm -hmm. It'll change you quite a bit. And that's why you have to talk about it. To find <laughs> out, will they say that about 50 bucks a month? Will that take them uh, aback? Because if so, that's a problem. Yeah. So can you tell us how many people did you have paying you or saying they were going to pay you before you actually had a product? What was, what was the number that was kind of a tipping point in your mind? Like, all right, if I get X people mm -hmm. ready to do it, then I might build this thing. Yeah, I don't think that's a good way to do it uh, by the numbers. The answer is I talked to 40 people, 30 said they'd pay, and 20 did before launch. Okay. Um, those are really, really good numbers. That's a sign that something's going really right because that's a high hit rate. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you should do it by the numbers. I've seen companies where they just absolutely have a home run clearly after talking to a dozen people, um, especially if it's a larger product and you can't really service more than that at first anyway, and mm -hmm. um, and they're in. Um and I've seen people like uh, uh, there's a company in town who's very successful, and it took them about 150 interviews before they finally locked down. It's called Food on the Table. Mm -hmm. They finally locked down exactly what this thing was. It just took a lot of meandering, and um, I suppose if you wanted to use buzzwords, you could say in pivoting or changing the the, the message until they locked. They found something that was really right. So I don't think you can set up a number. I think rather you have to look at what's going on in the conversations. If you're getting an extremely low hit rate of someone who will do anything, mm -hmm. like if it's 10%, 15%, who, who even agree that they would pay it all for it, um, you're, you're far from done. You need to drastically change what's going on mm -hmm. or even find another idea and so forth. Um, and even if they say it's a good idea. So I have another idea before WP Engine, which didn't pan out after customer development. And what happened was I would talk to, I would say what it was, and the response that everyone would give is, um, this is a terrific idea. You know what you should do with it? And then the next thing they said would be different for every person. 
One person says, so you should charge $1,000 a month and sell through VARs. And the next one says, so it should be freemium because I would use it for freemium and eventually pay. And then someone else would say, it needs to be 30 bucks a month because if it was free, I wouldn't trust it. And all this, you know, like, <laughs> but the first thing that everyone said is, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you really have to feel like um, not only are you getting positive feedback, not only would they say they pay for it, but that it's converging on a, a pretty small set of things that you need to do or a, a small set of pricing a sort of, sort of small price range that's going to work. Yeah. Um, and if any of those things aren't true, you haven't found it yet. And that's frustrating because it is hard to find. On the other hand, it wastes, you waste a lot more time if you proceed anyway, not having found that sweet spot, and, and simply flounder for a while. Yeah. No, we actually just had Steve Blank on the show. And one of the things he talked about with customer development was looking for the insights in those interviews, not necessarily just the raw data. Because the raw data says, you know, in that one uh, product that everyone liked, hey, 90% of them liked it. But the insight was they all liked it for different reasons, and <coughs> it wasn't converging onto a small set of things you could execute. Um, so I think you're, you're right along with what he's saying, is really looking for the insights in those interviews. Um, how large is WP Engine today? Because you guys have grown, you know, quite substantially. We have. So we have about 70 people now, um, and uh, we'll probably have 90 by the end of the year. We don't talk about a lot of our private numbers, but you know, it's in the tens of millions in revenue. It's in the uh, you know, tens of thousands of customers. Yeah. So let's talk about the growth of WP Engine a little bit, <clears throat> because you've got to watch a, a couple different companies grow now, and you're just involved in the ecosystem of growth. Um, what did the growth curve look like there at WP Engine? Is it just a linear day-by-day -day you add to it? Is there an exponential kind of tipping point? Talk us kind of high level. What does it look like? So different companies will have different growth curves naturally, and the curve itself and the type of curve will change over its um, lifespan depending on what's going on. I mean, obviously, when you're still trying to figure things out and get you know those those first couple hundred customers, it's going to be scrounging and scraping for each one, and it's not going to have a curve. It's like there's just not even enough data to call it a curve. You're just trying to get it going, right? Um, you don't really get something that you could call a curve or something predictable is another way to say that um, until you have systematic ways of growing. And there's lots of things that could be. For some companies, it means viral. For some companies, it means word of mouth, which isn't the same thing. Um, for some companies, it's paid advertising or affiliates or other. There's like a variety of paid stuff where it's events, uh, where it's PR based. In other words, they, they pop and you know with with uh, with news. Some of it's SEO. Like there's just all kinds of mechanisms, and those mechanisms will cause you to grow in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Now, the standard way to think about a SaaS company growing is exponential, and what I mean is. People talk about their growth in percentages. They say we tripled this year. They say we're well, you know we're growing at ten percent month over month. In other words, people's language is the language of exponential growth when they talk about SaaS companies. And actually, in my experience, that's not right. Okay. It's a, it's a very rare for a, a SaaS company, in fact, to be exponentially growing. And it's true when the growth mechanism is truly proportional to the size of the customer base. And that's true in a true viral situation, mm -hmm. where in fact the usage of the product requires bringing in other users of the product. That is truly viral and very rare, actually. It's mm -hmm. it's more common in consumer companies, often when you don't pay, which again <laughs> to me doesn't really count. Yeah. Um, um, it's very it's 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 hard to find something viral in B two B. It happens, right? There's things like email contact, uh, you know, contact management often, mm -hmm. right? Can be sort of viral. LinkedIn is viral in a way. Um, so things can be viral indeed, and then they can grow exponentially in truth. Mm -hmm. That's not usually what happens. Usually in a in a SaaS business, what happens is you you struggle and then unlock some particular growth factor. You figure out AdWords. You figure out Facebook ads. Uh, LinkedIn works. Google Plus. You figured out. Finally, you're on the first page in an SEO search. You know, something's happened that you've unlocked some channel mm -hmm. that has a substantial, for your current size, substantial amount of growth. And then that's adding a certain number of people per month, right? Mm -hmm. Which still doesn't mean it's exponential, right? That's still uh, linear. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you, you optimize or get better at that so that linear amount grows in a small linear way. And a linear thing that's growing in a small linear way is quadratic, right? It's a problem. Mm -hmm. That is typically how the companies grow, mm -hmm. quadratically. Um, I, I, th I haven't written about this yet, so this is the first <laughs> time I've said this um, uh, anywhere. But um, I looked at our own data, given this theory that it's quadratic. And then, uh, by the way, the, the sort of rest of that story is you'll saturate the channel. In other words, you'll, you'll kind of be buying all the AdWords you can buy, or, you know, et cetera. Um, and even though you may incrementally improve it with um, optimization, also channels generally tend to be less efficient over time by themselves. In other words, like in AdWords, you can imagine competitors also get decent AdWords. Uh, they, they bid more. 
And in general, the bids actually go up and the quality goes down over time. Same thing with magazines, same thing with trade shows, and so on. So actually, although, yes, you can get some lift by, conti- by some incremental improvement, there's also erosion. And so at the end of the day, you kind of call it even. Um, it's not going to be literally even, but mm-hmm. in terms of a broad scope, you think of it as even. And that means you need to find additional channels to continue the growth and yeah. layer on those additional channels. And since each of those are sort of parabolic and then level off, and hopefully you find another one, the whole thing in a healthy company is, in fact, still uh, um, parabolic in my opinion. And so what I did is I, I looked at our own sales data mm-hmm. and um, anonymously, I, well, I, what I mean is I, I told other people and they ran the data so I didn't have to see the data. Mm-hmm. But I asked folks like Dharmesh Shah at HubSpot and other people who are at um, well-known, quote-unquote, fast-growing, well, definitely fast-growing, but quote-unquote, exponentially growing startups mm-hmm. and asked them, hey, take your sales data, put it in Excel and do a parabolic fit. Tell me how it goes. Mm-hmm. And it's perfect. It's really? not an exponential. It's a parabola. Wow. So I want to do a little more, uh, you know, sort of research into like what does that mean? How would you <laughs> around that? But the the point is that's the right way to think about growth. You want to say, you know, what does the curve look like? Blah blah blah. I think parabola is the right way to think about it. Layering on channels is the right way to think about it. Yeah. No, I think there's so many insights there. Um, let me ask you this: You talked about unlocking those channels. You kind of stumble upon something. You find something. Whatever it may be. How long, in your experience, does it take to hit upon one of those? Because some people are cold months in, they haven't found one yet, and they're discouraged. Should they be? Should they keep searching? Is it a red flag that they're, they don't have anything? Um, are, is it months? Is it years? When did you unlock things? <laughs> um, well, again, there, I, to me, there was different phases of it. So early on, it didn't take much. Like if you're only getting you know, three customers a month and getting up to ten is – doesn't take much unlocking, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can kind of stumble into some stuff, mm-hmm. or just have a good guest post, right? Yeah. Um, and then the bigger uh, that you are, the 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 more that that has to mean, mm-hmm. you know, right? To move the needle, yeah, and so exactly. it gets harder. Also, um, also, uh, it, you can try stuff and fail, and then and then and then later restart it. That's exactly what we did with our affiliate program. Our affiliate program originally complete failure. We worked on it for I don't know half a year, maybe more. Could not make it work. We gave up. Then a year later, we had a reason to retry. There was someone else who said, look, I know how to do affiliates. Okay. So since something was different this time, we figured we'd give it another try. And it did work the second time. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the time between us initially deciding to do it and then actually succeeding was multiple attempts in something like 18 months to two years. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, uh, we had early success with AdWords, and then that was great for a while. And then recently, they, it's just been... Um, absolutely insane pricing and so we've stopped doing that mm-hmm. but on the other hand we have great organic uh, search so in the meantime so that's been okay um, that's all just to say it varies a lot and that's a terrible it's a terrible thing to say it varies a lot because it's useless to say and it's also terrible to say experiment and guess and check that's what everyone says and that's not really <laughs> helpful the unfortunate thing is with paid uh, advertising there isn't a lot more to say mm-hmm. um, so um, and it changes over time something that worked suddenly won't and something that yeah. won't Will and so it's it not only that but after you unlock it you're not finished so it's unfortunate that that is sort of the not only the knee jerk advice mm-hmm. but there's not a whole lot of other stuff behind that unless you you know you've got a real AdWords expert who can go deep on that that of course is fantastic but in, in the broad scope unfortunately it is that yeah well, you know it is helpful because it reinforces what you said earlier about the need for multiple channels that kind of create that you know parabolic curve. Because what you're saying is it's chaotic. AdWords works, it doesn't work. Affiliates yeah. didn't work, it did work. If you don't layer on the channels the way you've described, especially for a SaaS company, um, eventually, given enough years, everything goes to zero. Because <laughs> that's just the way it's going to be, right? It, it may go to zero. It may not go quite to zero. I don't think affiliates will go to zero now. Um, if you don't do anything, though. Maybe, you know? AdWords maybe did. Um, uh, but... Uh, um, I, you don't have to be too paranoid about it and expect <laughs> it. but yes of course like after you after you sort of uh, again unlock and understand and and you know sort of are systematically using a channel and that's under your belt in a sense mm-hmm. yes you know the next thing to do is um not to uh, not that you won't um continue to optimize but um but that will pale in comparison to another channel in terms of its impact and and usefulness of the company yeah. to your company so i mean you should be able to get you know a, um at least 2x and possibly as much as 10x from an adding another channel rather than incrementally optimizing, which is never going to give you 2x. Like you, once you have AdWords, you know, when you're spending 10, 20 grand a month on AdWords, um, it's unlikely that optimization is going to get you 10x out of that. There's just not enough left over in that channel to go scrape. But another mistake would be to go and try to do three or four channels at once. 
um, and decide I'm going to do all of these because it's important to have multiple channels. Like you need to get the company off the ground. Mm -hmm. You need to get the growth engine going. You need to have a systematic way where every day you wake up and you know you have one, even one sign up, but every day, right? Or ten, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, it's, so you don't want to dilute your efforts in a bunch of things. That's why I say once you get a channel under your belt, you're like, I understand this. It's working. I'm, you know, I'm able to reinvest in it. I think I've hit. Um, more or less the limit of what I can do. Uh, incremental benefit is valuable, but only incrementally. Now it's time to go find it, uh, you know, gotcha. to go get another channel. Otherwise, you're diluting your attention. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you've raised money and you can afford a big team to go blow money through, um, so they really can in parallel do that mm -hmm. without hurting the other efforts, then fine. But like that's uh, that's almost no one. And so uh, you know, focus. And we we did too. Like I I definitely did that at Smart Bear. I did that. Um, WP Engine and before Smart Bear, I did another company, IT Watchdogs, also grew it for four years and sold it. Also made more than a million dollars in revenue you know, per year on that with that company. It was a hardware company. So mm -hmm. and, and we we advertise in magazines, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, still, still all the same stuff that I'm saying. So I really do believe um, as a macro thing, even over more than a decade of time and different media formats, that is the, that is a good way to look at it. Yeah. So just kind of sum it up. You know, long term, you're going to want to have multiple channels, but in the short term, you need to master one and then move on when the changes become incremental or you'll dilute yourself and you won't ever actually find the channels that work. Um, it kind of reminds me, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you retweeted uh, the last couple of days something about um, shareholder value. Was that you uh, yeah, that retweeted yeah. that? Yeah. And about how Apple grew because they added new product lines. And you know other companies, they really return value because of adding entire new categories, not incremental changes in existing categories. That's right. And it's kind of the same thing with growth itself, is that adding a new channel will be far more beneficial than incremental changes at some point, but you have to master the channel to even get to that point. That's right. Yeah. Um, now, let me ask you this. Today, just because it's interesting to kind of know how different companies work, it, it may be applicable to others or not. Um, where does most of your acquisition come from now? What's the, the main or maybe even the mix of channels that you've kind of stumbled upon? Well, fortunately, there isn't one main one. Um, in fact, that's a sign of weakness. Once you're at, no, really, once you're at scale, if, if you're dependent on only one channel for most of the stuff, uh, most of your growth, that's a problem because if something goes wrong there, it drastically affects the company. Um, fortunately, the number one thing is word of mouth. And that is something where you hope it can continue as long as you continue to have, to, you know, to, to maintain the level of service and quality that um, that earned you that word of mouth in the first place. And of course, it is difficult while you scale to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, we can in fact keep that up. Um, but it's a variety of things. You know, as I say, we we have all these different adver uh, paid advertising channels in digital, um, everything from text to, to banner stuff. There's affiliates. We go to lots of events. Um, and, and that's very very useful for us, mm -hmm. not for all companies certainly, but for us it is. Um, and there's, there's a, at this point, there's a wide variety of things that we do, and we're constantly testing and new things. And mm -hmm. for example, we just um, tried Facebook ads again for the I don't know how many time and failed again, <laughs> but we'll probably try again uh, uh -huh. <laughs> later. Like that's oh, that's great. Yeah. Now earlier you mentioned uh, word of mouth, and you mentioned it next to virality, and you made the side remark they're not the same thing. So my guess is you have some feelings on that, and you just mentioned that word of mouth is really good for you guys. So what's the difference? What is word of mouth? What is virality? And how do they get confused? Well, we're a great example of uh, no virality and great word of mouth. Okay. Perfect. People tell each other about us because we they genuinely like the service. It is in fact a good service. <laughs> Whether, whether we're talking about the product itself, the, you know, the hosting service, or we're talking about the humans that they t talk to on the phone, mm -hmm. and it is in fact good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they, so when anyone else says, "Hey, I need to host somewhere," they recommend us. That's word of mouth. Gotcha. Viral okay. is that the nature of the product itself causes other users to come into being. Mm -hmm. We don't. If somebody has a food blog and hosts with us, that in itself does not create new, um, n new hosting customers for us. They don't talk about hosting on a food blog, mm -hmm. right? Like that doesn't even make sense. It would yeah. be weird to advertise us on the food blog. So the nature of the usage of the product itself does not produce other users. So that's why it's not viral, yeah. uh, but it is word of mouth. And so like to me, any company um, that's not um, literally just trying to do something that's a scam or um, um, like arbitrage or something, any company should be striving to have a huge word of mouth component. Um, not only because that's the cheapest and the highest fidelity marketing um, channel you could have, but because it's indicative that you are in fact doing something valuable and good, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. of course, that's it's that's customer that's, development, <laughs> right?
um, better is if it's viral. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, it, it is. It is unfortunate this particular business isn't viral, and it's an actually good question. Could it be made at least a little viral in some way? Like, could we have a customer referral program, and and uh, that's still not really quite viral, but maybe it's in between. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question, but the, but our business model doesn't lend itself to being viral, which is of course okay. It's just something to know, and that just means we have to be that much more good at other kinds of you know uh, uh, methods of growth. If you can produce a company uh, that has a viral component for real, as you know, everyone says they have it. Few people actually have it, but if you really do have it, fantastic. And and but uh, you know that is in fact you know wonderful. And the one other caveat I put on that is viral stuff only works once you're at scale. It doesn't matter if you have a great viral component and four customers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, you know the customer grace gr base grows by itself, five percent per month, right? So it's five, and then it's still five, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, it doesn't matter at first. So it is terrific to have that component, but it doesn't absolve you of the need to to get the growth kick started, sort of like a starter motor, right? Mm -hmm. um, you still have to do stuff. Now, if you have the viral component, you're more free about what that can be. So, for example, PR. Uh, guest posting, uh, you know, social media, things like that, which are ephemeral, mm -hmm. um, and therefore not a, actually a terrific way to for sustain growth, but they are a terrific way to maybe get a pop to get some user base to then let the viral component take over. That could mm -hmm. be. So that's what I mean by you're you're more free to do more kinds of things because it's okay if it's temporary. When you have a viral component, you're back. But typically, you don't know that the viral component is going to work until you're at scale. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg, like. Yes, try to build that in. That is such a better business model. But you kind of, in my opinion, don't want to depend on that anyway. And certainly you can't at the start. Yeah. No, that's a great insight. Uh, now, let me ask you this. You know, looking back at Smart Bear and now WP Engine, how does the growth uh, look similar and how is it different? Um, how do you see the two as you kind of look back with some perspective on them? Uh, completely different. Mm -hmm. And, um, why not? They're completely different kinds of businesses. Uh, Smart Bear was all enterprise uh, software focused. Um, we, uh, you know, at, at WP Engine, we do have um, big enterprise customers, but the bulk of our customers by volume are small. Um, uh, WP Engine's uh, a re recurring revenue business. Smart Bear wasn't. Um, I mean, just you can just the, the markets are different, the audience is different, the way they buy is different. I mean, you just go down the line. All kinds of things about it are different. The only thing they have this in common is they're both selling software, but. Um, that's that's actually not a lot in common, and so yeah. not surprising. The models are very different. So was it a learning curve going to WP Engine? And that that's kind of what I'm getting at is because you knew a lot about growth before WP Engine. You not, knew a lot about how to scale something, how to sell something. Um, but then you come to WP Engine, and if so many things are different, is it mm -hmm. still kind of a steep learning of like, all right, let me refigure out this. Maybe some principles apply, but I still have to figure out this. I think regardless of how old you are and how many companies you've started, if you don't go into a new company with eyes open, mind clear, <laughs> ready to learn and figure things out for this market at this time with this technology, with this team, um, and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, including all the technologies and techniques and stuff around growth, mm -hmm. but also everything else, <laughs> then you are um, – you're hobbling yourself, you're adding risk to the company, and you're kind of an arrogant prick on top of that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, totally eyes wide open. Now, sure, there's going to be things here and there that uh, you know, I, I don't screw up. Or, you know, the first time we had – our first enterprise customer at WP Engine was new for the team. But for me, it was like I did that for seven years. Mm -hmm. No problem. Like I know it, here's what's going to come. Here's how it's going to work, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, of course, there's like certain things you pluck out and go, now, see, we, there's all kinds of things we didn't mess up doing this, doing that, doing the other thing, mm -hmm. especially when you get into things that are generic for any kind of business. The way an enterprise sale works is very similar for most businesses. Mm -hmm. The way finance needs to work, what, you know, the, 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 the stuff that comes with finance. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of like sort of mechanical things in the business that isn't that different, and so yeah, that's terrific to get a um, head start. Or the fact that then I had a terrific network of of uh, uh, advisors and investors and stuff meant it was trivial for us to raise money 18 months in when we decided to go that way and stop bootstrapping. Um, yeah, that's uh, all. That stuff is is a huge benefit. So it's not that it wasn't you know I couldn't carry some wisdom forward or carry some mm -hmm. some sort of accreted value forward, but. Man, you have to go in with beginner's mind, as they say, um, or else I think you're 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 just putting blinders on, and you're, you're lucky if even with blinders you still found the path. 
Yeah, that's great. Uh, now, you've been somewhat outspoken about data. And if people read your blog, you deal with data a lot. I mean, the math you put on there, it goes deeper than most people are, are comfortable with, I think. Uh, you have to really want to learn this stuff. Um, but let's talk about data for a second because you've talked about the times when startups shouldn't focus on data. So talk me through some of those. When do startups just kind of miss the boat, they're so worried about data, and they should be focused on X, Y, and Z? Well, I love that Lean Startup has, has caused us to be experimental and look at data and try to be objective. And certainly the pendulum was too far one way on that, where people were just going on faith or whatever. But I also feel like the pendulum's maybe swung too far the other way. Mm -hmm. And now people are just maniacally looking at data and not thinking about what am I trying to do with this business? What is this? Why am why why am I doing this? Why now? What, why are these customers really buying? And not just because of data that show that they click or don't click, but because of some principle that I have or some theory that I'm letting the data prove or disprove, um, rather than just following the data uh, blindly. Also, you need a lot of data for the data to mean something. <laughs> Um, you know, I did a I did a talk at Business of Software that takes it takes an hour to to really beat you over the head to death. That it takes a lot of data, and not just a lot of data, but certain kinds of data. Um, you can have an A/B test with forty thousand data points over two weeks. That's absolutely not true. That Google Analytics and everything else will tell you is a real test. And I have an example of that of a startup in town that did exactly that with that much data, but it wasn't an A/B test. It was an AA test. It was a test of the page against itself. And after 40,000 data points, <laughs> two weeks, and Google saying it had an 85% chance to, that one beat the other by a whole point of conversion, it's the same page. Uh -huh. It's still not valid. And That's I, you know, awesome. So as you say, I do have some formulas and things around that to, to actually get at the root of it. But the point is... It actually takes quite a lot to have data that's real. So what that means is, not that you don't look at data, but that you recognize that, especially early on, you don't have enough data mm -hmm. in the story. So rather than obsessing over the little data, which is actually not telling you what you might think it does, again, to look more holistically at what's going on. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'll say is, early on, you can only, the only kind of data that you can, you can in which you can see changes with, with, um, with confidence is massive changes. You can't tell a 10% change in conversion rate when you're converting one person a day. Mm -hmm. It's literally not possible to measure that with statistical accuracy. Mm -hmm. So you're just measuring noise. Yeah. So, but, you, but if it goes from one a day to three a day and stays that way, that's real. I don't care who you are, right? Yeah. So that's what I mean. Early on, you're looking for huge changes, not small incremental changes, big, massive changes. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only thing that you, and, and by the way, that's the only thing that matters to your business anyway. Again, one a day and you change it 10%, you, well, what, now you get to quit your day job? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> right? So, I mean, only massive changes are valuable to the business anyway at that, at that point. So yeah. it's, all, it's just as well. But it's, it's useful to say that um, also because you can back into, well, then what does that mean I should be doing? Should I be doing, therefore, incremental changes to the pages themselves and just playing with headlines? Or should I be changing with big changes to the page that might have big outcomes as opposed to little easy changes which probably actually – We'll just have little outcomes that I can't measure anyway, you see? Yeah. So having that notion of big outcome backs into big, big, um, you, you know, big variation changes in order to get to somewhere different than where you are now. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and let me ask you this, you know, when it comes to the AA test that you mentioned, I mean, that's just like so insightful to think about that. And there's kind of a dilemma that I see here, which is if you're a big company, you have the data points and you can make some decisions. But then when you ask people for specifics like, well, how should I do this or how should I do that? They say, well, it's only relative to your company, so you just need to go test. But a small company doesn't have the data to even test. So right. it's kind of like they're not allowed to use your data, but That's they don't right. have any data. So what does a small company do? Do they just focus on the obvious big things like you said and just leave the data for another day? Is, is that the answer in some sense? Yeah, I mean, it's not that you don't collect the data and you don't look at it because, again, you're looking for big changes in things like conversion rate or the time they spend on the page or how much it's costing to acquire a customer. Like, you're totally measuring all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just to not fool yourself around, I have a 10% lift. When you, when you couldn't possibly know that. So it's not that you can't have the data from bigger companies. I could tell you things about what we're doing, but mm -hmm. for us, a 10% change is absolutely measurable and it's impactful. Yeah. In fact, not only is it material to the top line, but it means we're suddenly behind on hiring and support and we might need to hire five more people next month than we thought, which yeah. is sort of an insane thing if you think about like the mechanisms that, right? So it, it, it's, not that the, it's not that you can't have our data, Mm -hmm. It's that it's a whole different sort of thing that you're trying to do anyway and, and implication on the other side and so forth. Yeah. Um, 
So it's not relevant to, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's why. So yes, uh, measure the data, but looking for big swings. And the other thing is thumbnailing stuff. So um, I had a recent post, I don't mean to plug a blog all the no, time, but I <laughs> um, about how much should I pay per click when I don't have enough data to know what I should pay. Mm -hmm. Um, because I don't know my conversion rate and I don't know my, my lifetime value of the customer because my business is only four months old, so I don't know how long they'll stay. Till they, <laughs> you know, like, um, so, I had, so what I did is I, 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 uh, I thumbnailed it by saying, look, this is really good kind of rules of thumb of what should be a ratio to what. And uh, there's a survey of 100 small startups, and I did sort of an informal survey around the co-working space that um, WP Engine is in at the moment, although we're, we, we're about to move in, in less than a month. Um, and so I found certain things. I'll tell you them right now, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, a 1% conversion rate is pretty standard. Um, out of 100 uh, startups, almost all of them were within 0.2% of 1% conversion rate. Mm -hmm. So that's good. So if you're not sure where your conversion rate will end up, that's actually a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, and so you can back out things like, so, so the end of the story of this particular calculation, you can look at the post if you want to see the derivation, is you take the MRR, so the recurring revenue you're going to get each month, mm -hmm. monthly recurring revenue, and divide by 25. And again, the post, it goes, it goes into the detail of why it's not a magic number, right? Yeah. And that's how much you can pay per click. So if it's a $50 a month product, you can pay $2 a click sort of rationally, even before you have all the data to really know. And of course, as you accumulate data, of course, you'd want to adjust that to the truth. And in fact, you could use that, that mechanism and, and you know, which, whichever of those assumptions you then collect data around, you can, of course, fix them and, and get a, a more accurate thing for you. Yeah. But that's what I mean by, um, it's not that you can't do anything, it's just you need to thumbnail stuff and know it's a thumbnail and keep moving. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, in the intro, I said that, you know, whenever you speak or whenever you do these interviews, um, people generally just love them. I mean, that's just, that's the response, you know, that I've seen online. But there was one talk you gave that I think just keeps popping up. It's like every time it's on somebody's radar, they just feel the need to tell you about it. <laughs> and it's what you said at MicroConf 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I, there must be five or ten blog articles just written about your presentation and them, like, giving your notes from it on, on what you said and why you said it. I, it had a big impact on people. So I want to dive into it a little bit because sure, it's sure. really based around one particular sentence and everything kind of you know comes from that and yeah. um, you wanted to help people how to create a money machine and maybe that's why they loved it because they like that idea I don't know and, but, and, uh, and to be clear, to be clear it's, a, it's a money machine where you quit your day job and you've got a business but if the goal is not to make necessarily it could be but the immediate goal is I want to quit my day job and make something between a hundred thousand a year and a million a year yeah I'm not trying to like be Twitter or any of these kind of things, exactly. right? It's very practical. I want to make, I want to quit my day job and run my own business. Period. Yeah. I'm not. I don't. I don't need to. Maybe if it, if it takes off, great. If it doesn't, great. That kind of thing. Yeah, and that, that's why I was at MicroConf. I mean, it's a perfect audience yeah. for that. Um, but what you said was, and you can tell me if I got it right here because I'm getting this secondhand of all the people that heard you. But is that uh, you create a money machine through predictable acquisition of recurring revenue with annual prepay in a good market. And so unpack that for us because uh, each phrase of that has a lot of meaning that I think this audience can, can take away from. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like a contrived sentence, and it is, mm -hmm. which is why it was the last slide. In other words, I went through the whole, everything about it, and then I said, and here's like your sort of takeaway thing that summarizes, because otherwise it's just a weird meaningless sentence with buzzwords, right? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so unpack, we can go the other way and unpack it the other way. Well, I had to start from there because we can't give the presentation here. <laughs> That's right. So, so what's the first one? The re, uh, recurring uh, Predictable acquisition, I believe. So the first thing about um, being able to have a sustainable business where you quit your day job is that next month it will have at least as much revenue as this month mm -hmm. and certainly not like a grand and, and suddenly you're screwed, mm -hmm. right? So that's where the predictable acquisition of customers, that's why. That's why. Mm -hmm. And the word predictable is very interesting because it immediately discredits a whole bunch of ways to get customers. SEO is not predictable, mm -hmm. right? Even, a, even like a huge, incredible, um, incredibly organized, intelligent, force of a company like Mahalo mm -hmm. can have the revenue cut um, 90% because Google does a little dance. Yep. It's not predictable. You can't base it on that. Does that mean SEO is valueless? No, of course not. But it's not predictable. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make a money machine, something that where it's going to make more money next month than the month before and so on and so forth, then it has to be predictable. So what's predictable? 
it's hard because customer acquisition is like the least thing that's in your control. What's in your control the most is adding a feature because you just do it, right? What's in your control the least is having someone find you and come and be convinced to sign up. That's the hardest in a way. Um, and so it's, it's the thing to tackle and understand the best. And so what predictable means generally is paid advertising. It doesn't have to be. But when you can pay, you know, you spend a dollar uh, this month and you make $4 over the year or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's predictable. And so just like we were talking about before, you know, picking up channels and, and making new ones and so forth, that kind of a thing. But with the mindset of I need to find things where, as, I mean, nothing's predictable in business, right? Sure. But, like, but your mindset is I'm trying to find things as predictable as I can. Mm -hmm. And SEO is, not, is definitely not, and AdWords is better. And we know AdWords isn't the end of the story and so on and so forth. That's okay. If we get it, if we get it cooking on that and then we find a second one, that's totally fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's the predictable part. So for that, you need a, a good engine of it's not too expensive to acquire a customer that way versus how much revenue I have. And what's it, this, this is actually, I mean, it, that sounds trite, but there's a really important point in here that almost all uh, small businesses uh, fail to do. So I'm gonna, that's why I'm, I'm harping on this point. If it costs too much to acquire a customer versus how much money you get, it doesn't work. So you have to charge a lot for your product. If you charge a dollar a month for the product, or you know, ten dollars a year, then how, then can you spend a two hundred dollars to acquire a customer? No, that's not a profitable business. If you can't, well, if you can't spend two hundred dollars um, to acquire a customer, all kinds of advertising and customer acquisition channels are not available to you. Uh, the only ones that are available the to you are. Ones. Or that are like cost a dollar or five dollars to acquire a customer, and those are very few. It turns mm -hmm. out, almost nothing is actually that cheap, and so you're screwed, actually. Yeah. And if one of those few things you can't make work, you don't have a business. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, <laughs> the way to make that not the case is to not charge a dollar a month, but instead to charge fifty dollars a month, hundred dollars a month, or have a couple of tiers that average out to eighty, hundred, hundred twenty dollars a month mm -hmm. uh, in, to, in, in total demographic, right? So you have to charge more for your product, 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 mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> because among other among the other things, like you get more revenue, duh, mm -hmm. and can get there faster because you if, you know charging fifty bucks a month, you can scrounge up fifty or hundred customers just by um, you know elbow grease, even mm -hmm. if it's not mechanical yet, and you kind of got a business going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's predictable. That's not yeah. true. If you, like like just everything gets solved by charging more money, charging more money, and you say, well. But who would pay for that and you know that much for this thing? Mm -hmm. And my response is, you need to make something that's worth that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to be because it has so many features or because you answered the phone on the first ring. Those are not the only reasons why people pay. It's how much value they're getting out of it. It's yep. what's, what's changing for them and the kind of customer you're going after in the first place. A lot of times, for example, businesses, um, people can charge $50 a month on their credit card and not ask. Mm -hmm. If they can buy something that's not their own money and they don't have to ask, it's very easy. They could care less if it's 50 or 40 or 30 because mm -hmm. they're not asking. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why things can be a lot of money besides how many features you have or something like that. Yeah. Any point is, so it's good for all kinds of reasons and, and just sort of to put the, the, the final nail in it on, um, on um, um, the cost of customer acquisition. And if you charge $50 a month for product, spending $200 to acquire customers is now rational. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. that's why. And, and if, you can try, if you could pay that much, oh, my God, you could do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. All avenues are open to you. And, um, and that's exactly the point. You need to maximize the avenues open to you exactly because I can't tell you which channels work yeah. and so on and so forth. So you need to maximize how many options you have. Absolutely. And more money maximized. So that's just a very long way of unpacking um, just the part of predictable revenue, but that you sort of have to have high, uh, a high price or what mm -hmm. you might think of as a high price. $50 a month, not that high. But what you might think of a high price in order to really make that functional and and. Uh, you know, a, he a healthy business, lots of options to it. Yeah. And then the second part is recurring revenue. Um, I think this is obvious why that's important yeah, because it goes back to predictable. I mean, it has to be recurring yeah. or you right. start at zero every first of the month. That's right. Yeah. Um, any anything more to say there? Or is that it? No, I think that one's, that one's pretty <laughs> that good. That was it. And then <laughs> annual prepay. Now, this is the one that got a lot of people excited I yeah. think because they never really thought about it. It, it. It's somewhat obvious when you say it. But until you hear it, it's like, oh, that's why prepay annually matters. So unpack it for us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, like you say, it, it, it seems like maybe it's obvious, but people don't do it. But there's some non-obvious things, too, that's really important because it, it literally can transform the business. So I'll, I'll t mm -hmm. talk about those. So the, the obvious thing is the cash flow. If you get a lot more cash up front, that's better. Duh. Because you can put that cash right back in the business yeah. and or quit your day job because now it's cash flowing better. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so for example, you might say three months free if you sign up for an annual plan. So now you get nine months of revenue down. Yeah. Now sure, over the next 12 months, you only get nine months of revenue. You do let, make less money on that customer. Mm -hmm. You're paying, you're essentially paying them to get the cash flow today. Mm -hmm. but getting the cash flow today is incredibly valuable. And that's, by the way, true whether you're a massive company or whether you're a tiny company. It's always better to get the cash flow today. Mm -hmm. You'll have to reinvest that in the company and so forth. Yeah. Um, and whether that's more marketing or just being able to quit your job or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's the obvious part. The non-obvious parts are stuff like this. When someone opts into an annual plan, they're kind of raising their hand and saying, I want to be here for the long haul. Mm -hmm. That is actually a much more valuable customer. Interestingly, they're usually more likely to renew on an annual basis than monthlies. Ah, really? And again, it's probably self-selected as opposed to anything else, right? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, to know that about the customer and to know how many customers are in that category is actually incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. Does that change the way you communicate with them? Does that change um, you know, what you do for them? Does that change how you, how you handle tech support? You know, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's not obvious, but true. Um, another thing, uh, although be careful with your cancellation rate. Your cancellation rate needs to be the number of people who could cancel this month. Mm -hmm. You know, divided by the number, or on the bottom of the fraction, the number of people who do, because annuals don't. So it can if you don't do that and you just say number who canceled over all customers, you're artificially seeing a lower cancellation. So be careful about that. Yeah, and you have um, a great blog post. I think it's the top one right now on your blog if people want to read about the cost of cancellation, which was awesome. Yeah, so just be a little careful about that. So you're not fooling yourself. Um, nevertheless. Um, the other thing, uh, another thing that's, that's, that's not obvious is you can use this to raise your prices. Okay. So the typical thing when I say raise your prices uh, is they say is people say well I'm scared I don't know eh, there's some people who can't pay that and all these kind of excuses which generally aren't true mm -hmm. generally when you raise your prices um, if they're already pretty low nine bucks a month nineteen bucks a month and so forth usually you're um, it, for brand new companies you know um, usually your sign up rate doesn't change at all and you just make more money that's that's almost always what I see um, in any case. If you're scared, what you can do is you can raise your monthly rate, but then have an annual plan that essentially brings it back down to the current rate because uh, of the annual discount. Yeah. So now you're giving the, the customer choice. Either pay me a lot more money than you pay me today because month, monthly went up by 2x, 3x, mm -hmm. right? And that's fine. Hey, <laughs> hooray. <laughs> that's free money, right? Uh -huh. Or um, by giving me even more money in cash and in the same the business model that you, that you had previously decided was okay, but more money up front. Now the customer is satisfied because they have that same deal, but you have the cash up front, and you win both ways. Yeah. Another thing, so, so that's another subtle point that's mm -hmm. not obvious, but that you can use annuals to, in fact, um, raise rates because you've you've got a built-in way to discount for people who are sensitive, but in a way that's still valuable to you. Yeah. They're not getting the discount for nothing; they're getting the discount for giving you some cash flow. That's different. Yeah. yeah it's better. Um, Another thing is it, it sort of changes the perspective of the customer. And I know I'm just going on and on, but I think no, this is great. I mean, this is great insight. Yeah. Okay. Good. So it, it changes the perspective of the customer in terms of the pricing. So in other words, um, I'll give you an example. There was a, a, a company here at this co this uh, in Capital Factory in this co-working space here, where um, they were charging. Uh, I forget what their rate was. It was something like um, 300 bucks, and it was more for enterprise customers. And I said, "Wow, that's great. You get them to pay 300 bucks a month." And they say, "No, it's 300 bucks a year." I said, okay, hold on. Do this for me. For one week, change it to $300 a month and just see. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I said, look, the worst case is uh, you, know, you don't get any signups at all for a week. And so that's what? You lost uh, three signups, you know, um, and you tried. But actually, you only need like one of those new signups to cover a whole lot of loss in signups anyway. So just give it a try. And of course, he gave it a try, and there was no change in signups whatsoever. <laughs> it, right? So that's a 12x increase. Just yeah, by that's huge. Good. And I said, um, and by the way, and I said, so what are you going to do next? And he goes, oh, my God, now I'm going to um, buy these ad AdWords and do all this stuff. I said, no, you're going to raise your price again. <laughs> like, you just, you just changed your price by an order of magnitude and nothing happened. Yeah. And you were way off. Magnitude. You weren't even close. <laughs> yeah, right. So maybe not another order of magnitude. <laughs> yeah. Raise well, it, you know, take 500. 500. Who knows, yeah, you know? Right. Okay, so, all right. So you get the you get the point. Um, yeah. And anyway, so annuals annuals can be a play a part in that and so forth. Um, so that um, um, that's just a lot of reasons to do annuals that maybe aren't obvious. But that's why I say, and that's why I defend my statement that it could be transformative for a business. 
Yeah, like it, no, it, the difference of quitting your day job or not and raising your prices or not, it's that big a deal. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, and then the last kind of piece to the puzzle is it has to be in a good market. Um, how do you yeah. define good market? And maybe even talk about B2B and B2C in there a little bit if that's a part of it. It is a part of it. Um, this was this is, I don't know, maybe a third of that talk. So I can go uh, on and on about it. Um, I'll say... Um, I'll give you two things out of that. One is because you asked B2B, B2C. So if small business um, wants to make money and not just have active users, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. To me, got to go B2B. Yeah. I say got to. Look, of course, you can always point to customers, I mean, companies that do B2C and they're small and it works. Of course, it can work. Like, that's mm -hmm. not, nothing's absolute, of course. But if we're talking about, in general, what's easier? Like, the, the, running these companies is so hard. There's so much that doesn't go right. There's so much to figure out. Like, it's just... There's so many things running against you. Mm -hmm. B2C is just a lot, another thing against you, so don't do that. <laughs> like yeah. Businesses have money to spend, and $50 a month doesn't matter. And if, it, if it has any value at all, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's not true of a customer. $50 a month to a consumer? That's, I, oh, my God. Like I, I can't, like, I'm trying to think. What do I even do? Like Huge high bandwidth uh, connectivity at home, and even then I kind of complain? <laughs> like It's hard to even point to things that I... That a normal consumer spends that money on. like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. And so what you're driven into is is free because everything's free now for in consumers and you're or very very low cost. And again, that I think is death for a small company. Mm -hmm. So um, this is why I think B2C for a small company it just doesn't match the other things that you want to have. And so it really you're like stacking the deck against you. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. Um, the other thing I'll say about the market is um. In, in sort of Silicon Valley VC land, they talk about, oh, I want a huge growing market with lots of da-da-da. And so, um, okay, that makes sense. I mean, if you want to make a company with a billion dollars a year in revenue, which, for example, we're trying to do, mm -hmm. then kind of by definition, there needs to be a massive market of people spending money. I mean, mm -hmm. how else could it, what else could be, right? So, um, so that's, that's fine. And, we, and, and sort of bootstrapper small business folks, which again, I count myself as well because that's my, that's my heritage and, and that's also how WPM started, by the way, and then we mm -hmm. changed course. Um, um, but um, it, we tend to do the opposite. We say, no, see, that doesn't matter to us because we don't care about big markets. We only need a small market and be really focused and niche and win. Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't agree. Okay. That, that, that feels like a nice little balance thing. I don't agree. I actually want a big market also, even for a tiny company. And the reason is not because you need a billion dollars in revenue, but rather huge markets means tons of niches, tons of kinds of customers to go sell to, tons of ways of going and finding those customers, um, tons of different kinds of products they'll want, tons of different ways you can differentiate. Or for that matter, a lot of times you can be not differentiated in a big market <laughs> and still make plenty of money. That's great. How many, how many unzip tools are there? Yeah. How are they differentiated? Who the hell knows? Some, yeah. and some are free and some cost money. Did you know? <laughs> no, right? Yeah. Nevertheless, Nico Mac made a uh, million dollars a year with WinZip. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I think, uh, for example, um, look at things like productivity tools or email things or um, even things like um, 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 for consultants to, to track their time. <laughs> right, time tracking software like project manager software. There's all these things where it's a huge market, and you can totally make between again a hundred thousand a year and a million dollars a year just having another project management software. Mm -hmm. It's an execution, even if it's not really that differentiated. Mm -hmm. That's my point, though. Good. Mm -hmm. Again, everything's too hard. Yeah. So I want a space where. Um, if, even for a tiny company where if something doesn't work out, there's, there's another niche right next to me. In fact, there's five niches right next to me I can go try. Mm -hmm. And if this marketing channel doesn't work, that's okay because there's like 50 of them to go try. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why I like a big market because there's lots of options. And to me, optionality is how you de-risk uh, any kind of company. And so even for a small company, I like a huge market. So there's lots of other things I think about, uh, about what does it mean to have a, a market that's quote-unquote good. And again, like none of these things are absolute, but they're just like – Okay, but you're gonna to have to get, uh, overcome something mm -hmm. if you don't, you know, if you don't. And maybe, and that's fine because mm -hmm. you can't be you can't be perfect on every dimension. You're gonna to have to overcome some stuff. That's yeah. cool. But like, you know, don't it, make it harder than you need to. Yeah. So big, big market, just like the VC say, but for different reasons. Yeah. And B. Those are those are two parts of what I think a, the good market is for a co tiny company. Now that's great because I mean it flips the paradigm on its head the way a bootstrap or a self-funded person thinks. Mm -hmm. They think I'm not going after big market because I'm not VC money. When it's like, no, 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 big markets are good markets, whatever company you are, just for different reasons maybe. Um, yeah. And so and yeah, that's great advice. 
The focus is true. Like pick, picking a niche you, you can focus on and really win, that's still true. But then you have a niche right next to it if that one doesn't work. Yeah, in big market, there's a hundred of those or a thousand of those. Yeah. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, you have another one. Or if it does work, you still have another one. Exactly. Right? <laughs> like, it, it, right? So it's just, it's bad. even though you want to focus, like this is the playground you want to be in. Absolutely. Because if, if there's only one niche, period, it either works or it doesn't. And exactly. that's it. If it doesn't, you're, it's over, right? So. Yeah. It's a zero-sum game. That's awesome. So let me read the sentence again now okay. that we've kind of worked through it just to kind of sum it up in everybody's mind. You want predictable acquisition, a recurring revenue with annual prepay in a good market. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So, Jason, this has been an incredible interview. I mean, I'm going to re-listen to this myself even though I'm here right now because I need to learn this stuff. I need to hear it again. Um, let me ask you one last question as we close out sure. here. What's the, the best advice you have for any startup that's trying to grow? And I know it has to be high level. You don't have the specifics. You don't know what kind of company they are. But the vague fortune cookie advice, what would you tell a startup is trying to grow? Um, well, there's a couple of like kind of common patterns or anti-patterns. that I so, so, I mean, obviously, all these kind of things, like you want to know about the company, you want to know about the founding founders, what they want out of it, um, to, 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 to give good advice. Sure. But there's certain patterns I see a lot that are often the right advice. Mm -hmm. They'll just shoot those out and, and you know, everyone will have to decide if it's correct advice for them. Uh, one thing is actually about taking advice. People, <laughs> people ask for advice and someone gives them an answer. If that's true, that means they haven't really listened and sought to understand what you need from your company and they're, re they're doing a neat jerk regurgitated thing. Mm -hmm. Like go, go experiment or go get data or go, you know, like that, that means it's a non-answer. So, Take advice from people who actually dig in and ask about your goals, your things, your state, um, your market, and then tr give you some answers. That's real advice. That's one. Two, raise your prices. We already talked about it, but it's common, so I have to say. Three, um, um, know what it is that you want out of the company. And this is going to sound kind of new agey and, and sort of stupid, but I'm an engineer, and so um, if I'm saying it, um, then, then <laughs> it must be true. <laughs> yeah. Um, People just, you know, they kind of go in saying, and look, I did exactly the same thing, by the way. I say people. I, me, <laughs> okay, and everyone else too, okay. We go in, like, just excited that we're, we're going to be masters of our own destiny. We have a product. We're going to say fuck you to our boss. We're going um, to build a product the way we want. We're going to, et cetera, right? And that's all true. We're going to make money. That's all true. But we don't kind of consider what is it that we want to get out of this business anyway? What is the end result? And it's like, uh, not having a job. And it's like, okay, you don't have a job now. But what if you hate what you're doing? Or what if you're building a product that doesn't matter to the world? Mm -hmm. um, and that may be okay. You may say, look, I want to make a ton of money. I could care less. And you go, great. You should either you know, build a company that way or go work on Wall Street. Yeah. You know, that's fine. That's fine. Just now Just you know. know what you're in it for. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people don't know what they're in. And then when they achieve success with the business, they're unhappy. Mm. They're unhappy. They resent it. They want to sell it, get rid of it. Where they just hate life, and a lot of times it goes back to their spouse, their family, their employees, and it's extremely common, mm -hmm. especially if the business, if, if for example, one of the things that makes you fulfilled is actually writing code or actually doing marketing things, and then suppose you build a business in which you have 100 employees and you're the CEO, you're never going to do that. And you can be very unhappy and even incompetent potentially mm -hmm. in that role. So it, it, again, it's not about right or wrong. There isn't a right or wrong per se, but not knowing about yourself, what is it that you want out of this, what, what would be your ideal situation, and then you, starting from there and backing into, and therefore, how will I build a company around that? Otherwise, the company just sort of gets built in whatever form or fashion, and again, it's only up to luck whether that ends up in a place that you actually want. Yeah. And after all, isn't the promise of entre entrepreneurship to, get, to build the thing that you actually want to do? And that could mean selling it too, by the way, building things mm -hmm. and selling it be what you want to do. Um, that's what I've done with my previous companies. I don't want to run a company for 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. That's Again, like it's not right or wrong, but knowing what it is that you want out of it and then building it around that, that's how to actually achieve fulfillment in life through this, mm -hmm. which is the point that yeah. we don't think about or don't talk about. Um, so I feel like nobody thinks about that, including me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it has to be told to think about it and back it in. And, um, and then you start getting comfortable around, yeah, I want to build a little company that's just me, and I don't want employees. That sucks. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and great, now I can ignore everything that comes out of Silicon Valley, and I can <laughs> yeah. ignore all the people that ask me about funding. I can be like, I, I'm free. What do you do? Right? And that's <laughs> right. amazing. Or, or on the other hand, you want to build next Twitter. Fantastic. Then don't listen to, half, to most of what I said in this interview, because it's a whole different path if you want to be Twitter. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. uh, that's cool. Just you got to decide. 
so that you're building the kind of uh, life that you want. Um, and you're taking the right kind of advice and not mm-hmm. straddling you know, the, the path. You're picking a path and then trying to build down that path and, and not sub-optimizing by sort of you know, hedging or not, not deciding, right? That's yep. suboptimal. So that's a common pattern. Oh, that's great advice, Jason. And it's great advice to end on. Thank you again so much for coming on Growth Hacker TV. You bet. Thanks for having me.